So what I'm going to be talking about is um, ultra fast X-rays, um, X-rays generated from high harmonic generation, but also X-rays generated from free electron lasers for approaching at a second probing. Some of the work I'll talk about is gas phase probing, but some of the work I'll talk about is also condensed phase. And, and also I'll talk at the end a little bit about some recent results on high harmonic generation directly from liquids. So basically, I'll start by just uh, motivating why we want to make ultrafast measurements with X-rays. And essentially, the motivation here is we can use all the power of X-ray scattering and X-ray spectroscopy to do um, both um, structural and dynamic measurements in matter. And, and that extends, of course, from gas phase also, but to uh, particularly importantly to condensed phase system. Then I'll talk to you a little about some recent progress with at a second pulse generation at XFELS. Um, and then I'll switch to high harmonic generation. I'll give you a, a quick overview of some recent work we've been doing on uh, HHG based X ray spectroscopy, time resolved HHG based X ray spectroscopy of exciton dynamics in organic semiconductors. And then I'll conclude by talking about some other recent work where we've been studying a high, the mechanism behind high harmonic generation from liquids. So I guess the primary science drivers for ultrafast x-rays is this real-time access to um, uh, matter and its dynamics at the quantum scale. And by the quantum scale, I mean the quantum time scales, you know, things that are happening fast, femtosecond, sub-femtosecond time scales, and also the spatial scales, the, the angstrom kind of uh, tenth of a nanometer scale. And I, in order to understand why uh, we need uh, new X-ray sources, I've spent my last year uh, writing a science case for a UK X-ray free electron laser. So I've been uh, living in this space uh, to try and make that case. And so basically, um, longer pulse X-ray sources kind of run out of juice at around um, uh, a, a, a few hundred picoseconds. And so if you're going to probe into the, the tens of picoseconds or the sub-picoseconds or the sub-femtoseconds or even the sub uh, the sub femtosecond regime, the attosecond regime, you're going to need um, a very short pulse source of X-rays and X-fells are one solution to that. And the other solution to that are high harmonic sources. So they both can offer the possibility of time resolved X-ray spectroscopy. Of course, X-ray fells have the additional advantage because of their brightness. You can also do um, atomic scale uh, time resolved diffraction. And uh, there's a more of a discussion on this kind of uh, uh, landscape of ultrafast time scales and what you might be able to do in a recent uh, review, I, 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 which was published uh, in Nature Reviews in Physics uh, a couple of weeks back. And you, you should take, take a look at that if you're interested in that overview. And more um, pertinently, just yesterday, we released the UK XFL science case draft um, to go into a further consultation with the community. So I, I encourage everyone uh, listening to go and take a look at that and, and, and look at the very broad breadth of science that ultra-fast x-ray sources uh, can tackle. Okay, so now let's talk about the, uh, the uh, two um, sources for few to sub-femtosecond x-ray pulses. One is high harmonic generation and the other are x-ray fells, x fells. And I'm going to give you some examples based upon work that my group has been involved in over the last few years that illustrates what can be done, uh, and in particular with an eye towards condensed phase uh, ultrafast problems. So for some, some time, we've been trying to push XFEL time resolution to the, to the few femtosecond limit. So we've been working mostly at LCLS with collaborations uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the Pulse Institute at Stanford and, and other collaborators in University of Connecticut and, 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 and various places around the world. And so one of the uh, uh, nice outcomes of that collaboration was a, was a, a measurement of the um, acetylene vinyl dean uh, isomerization uh, with a sort of 10 femtosecond. Uh, so this was an X-ray induced isomerization and sort of managed to resolve with sort of 10 femtosecond time resolution, uh, the fragmentation, the, the reorganization uh, as written into the fragments. Um, more recently, we used um, 10 femtosecond X-ray pulses to study the uh, fragmentation dynamics uh, under an X-ray field of, of, of fullerenes. And that's a model for what might happen if you're looking at a biomolecule and trying to image it. So that was published just in December in Nature Physics. 
And another thing we've been doing is trying to improve the time resolution you can extract from these relatively noisy sources. Everything fluctuates from a SASE XFIL. And so you need ways to get really good time diagnostics in every shot. And so to, to, to measure the, the pulse duration and the interpulse delay, you, we, we found that we could get much improved performance by using machine learning uh, methods. And that was also recently published. But I want to tell you about some work that we're, we're kind of excited about at the moment, and that's X-ray pump, X-ray probe measurements of transient hole states. So we, like many people in the community, are interested in the possibility of charge migration and, 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 and these uh, non-exponentially -exponential, decaying states. And we wanted to see if we can go beyond what's been done so far with uh, high harmonic sources in the XUV and, and, and strong laser fields to do the probing step. And so what we did, we looked at a system, we actually had looked at the same system using exactly that conventional method, but we also did an experiment where we used two X-ray pulses. The first pulse creates um, a series of, of, of valence uh, shell holes, including a, a particular set of inner valence holes that have interesting dynamics. And the second pulse is tuned resonantly from the oxygen 1S state into that state to give us a resonant probing of the existence of the hole. And the, uh, uh, the, the curve on the top right hand side uh, that shows the, the measurement where we were able to resolve uh, essentially uh, a few femtosecond decay time, which agrees rather nicely with Bridget's uh, calculations uh, predicting that that whole state will decay with a few femtosecond decay time. I haven't got time to talk about all the nuances of that experiment. That wasn't done with an attosecond pulse. It was done with a pulse that had a duration of about two and a half to three femtoseconds. But nevertheless, in the near future, we hope to do similar experiments as part of the attosecond campaign at LCLS to actually really push these sorts of measurements into the sub femtosecond time resolution. So why are we saying we can do that? Well, the reason we can do that is now there are isolated at a second X-ray pulses at XFELs. Um, a couple of years back, the first of these was demonstrated in the hard X-ray region using a, a nonlinear compression of the electron bunch that, that generated a very, very short X-ray pulse, probably about 200 at a seconds. Um, more recently, using um, the control you can get between the harmonics in a seeded fell, the team at Fermi demonstrated at a second pulse train in the XUV. So, you know, a similar kind of spectral range to where you access uh, with high harmonic generation and, and able to synthesize a pulse train with high fidelity. But the result I want to talk about is the one we, my team was involved in, which was published in January this year in Nature Photonics, which was the first demonstration of tunable, isolated at a second X-ray pulses from an XFEL where we have gigawatt peak power. So this is a game changer. We would argue it changes the landscape of what you can do in at a second science from doing simply linear spectroscopy to com contemplating doing nonlinear spectroscopy as an example. So I won't talk to you about the mechanism by what well, the process by which we make those short pulses, because I don't think there's time. Uh, but essentially, we, we, we dress the electron bunch with a field, electromagnetic field, and, and, and that energy dressing of the electron bunch due to the field uh, is transferred in a, in a chicane, in a sort of phase space transfer, into a density modulation. So you, you force the electron bunch to laze on a single SASE spike, and that's what gives you the really short pulse duration, and you can do a larger extent select the photon energy that, that that goes at and the trick is to be able to measure you've really got out of second pulses and so we borrowed heavily from the uh, at a second science arena and used this wonderful machine that James Cryan and his team put together which is a, a, a coaxial VMI so it allows you to get angular resolution uh, with the x-rays going straight through the detector so but, 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 but through a hole not not straight through the detector making a hole um, and and then you use a circularly polarized streak field and you do basically an atom clock measurement. And so when you do that, you, as long as your X-ray pulse is significantly shorter than the cycle time of the, of the laser, which it was, you can uh, identify the pulse duration just from the angular spread on the detector of photoelectrons. And that allowed us to measure the pulse duration of the X-rays and found that although they jittered a bit from shot to shot, their mean value was about 300 attoseconds with a spread of about plus or minus 100 attoseconds. And, and, and as I said, th th these, of course, have a very high spectral bandwidth, typically about 5 EV spectral bandwidth, and, and this high uh, peak power. 
So to put that into context, here is a plot from the paper. I've added an extra point from our recent work at, uh, at Imperial, which is this blue triangle down here, which is our generation efforts um, at uh, using HHG to go above the oxygen K edge. And although that's a really nice technique, and I'll tell you about how we're using it in a moment, um, its power is, is something like um, eight orders of magnitude below that that you can now generate with isolated as a second pulses from an x-ray fell and that's really a game changer because it means you can now drive non-linear x-ray interactions you can do x-ray multi-dimensional spectroscopy i think you can probably do single shot um x-ray spectroscopy which 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 could be also a game changer if you're looking at, at highly transient uh, uh, and rare events and 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 and, uh, and you know that's why i would say that hhg is a wonderful technique but it has significant limits in terms of power and if you want to do stuff into the real x-ray range there's this new opportunity which i think is really attractive and and, and, and is going to give us high time resolution as an illustration of the power of that i'm not going to talk about the, the results because they're, they're still under analysis and there's some really exciting stuff in that analysis i was discussing that with James and, and co yesterday but but basically doing a measurement of photoionization delays is perfectly possible using this angular streaking technique and these atta second pulses and so in this case uh, the, you can resolve the delay between ionization from the nitrogen 1s state and the oxygen 1s state but we've also been looking at OJ delays with respect to uh, photoelectron delays and the real big power of the method is because this is a very tunable source um, you can put your atta second pulse pretty much wherever you want so you can get a nice scan over a large photon energy range of of of, of delays and, and build up a real picture of the of, 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 of the scattering but probably the more important thing about this is the fact that it's very bright and therefore you can drive nonlinear processes and one of the nonlinear processes you can drive is impulsive um, x-ray Raman and, and, and the point about x-ray Raman with with these pulses of, of, of bandwidth 5 EV or, or larger is you're not it's not like ordinary Raman where you drive a suit you create if you're in the impulsive regime a superposition of vibrational states now you're creating a superposition of electronic states so you can use um, uh, core, core resonances to select um, where within a molecular system you're going to create an electronic wave packet and to, to, to and and with a very high time resolution so you could create electronic wave packets in matter with a high time resolution and a high spatial resolution and to demonstrate this we did an experiment in the no molecule in fact the same one we were looking at with the streaking and have strong evidence um, in good agreement with antonio picon's calculations which is the green curve of the of the um impulsive raman effect so we're basically looking at the the xsi ionization uh, to the NO plus um, uh, cation um, from states that are populated um, uh, by the uh, impulsive Raman. And, and, and that gives us a, a nice idea that we're actually really able to do this impulsive Raman for the first time. And that's under review at PRL. We hope it will be accepted pretty soon because the, the first round of reviews was very positive. So the dream is to be able to do um, Nonlinear X-ray spectroscopy, and this is the the dream as presented by Shaw Mukamel some years ago. You create an electron wave packet at one site in a molecular system, and then you watch the coupling of that to other sites by probing uh, using the same impulsive Raman method at different sites uh, with various uh, delays. Now I'm a conscious of the fact that time is rolling on, so I'm going to come back now to high harmonic generation. Um, I'm not going to dwell on our high harmonic generation source at Imperial. It's basically just um, an OPA, which is pulse compressed down to the few cycle limit. And we work typically at 1.8 microns and uh, pulse durations of about 10 to 12 femtoseconds actually at the interaction point. And using that, we've been able, uh, and, and this is very similar to work that Jens has reported, we've been able to generate um, high harmonics with cutoffs as high as uh, 600 electron volts. Um, we cover the main edges of the water window, the carbon edge, the oxygen, the nitrogen edge, and the oxygen edge. And indeed, we have a reasonable flux. Um, and and the, the, the key thing is that because 
we can uh, see C phase dependence shifts of the uh, of the cutoff. That indicates that it, with the correct spectral filtering, you've essentially got an isolated at a second pulse around those cutoff energies. And we can tune where the cutoff is by changing various parameters. And um, I won't go into the details of the source, but we were able to make the first uh, HHG-based Zanes measurement at the oxygen K edge using that source. Uh, the nitrogen K edge, it's a cinch to make measurements and there's uh, other people are doing nitrogen edge time resolved measurements now as Zhang Cheng among others uh, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 I guess this is a really useful tool because it's relatively compact it's not a free electron laser it only costs a couple of million quid to build as opposed to a billion um, so what we've been particularly interested in is applying this to organic semiconductors. So these are solid state systems, they're, 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 they're thin film targets, they're polymers. Um, and we're interested in particular in this material, P3HT, which is a kind of uh, a, 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 a Ar uh, archetypal material for uh, photovoltaics, organic photovoltaics, where the exciton is around the uh, 500 nanometers. And the idea is we want to be able to study what the exciton does in time uh, using X-ray spectroscopy for the first time. Um, we did static measurements on this material way back when Alan Johnson was doing his PhD and we got really nice static Zane spectrum at the sulfur L edge and at the carbon K edge, very high resolution, as good as anything you could report from a synchrotron with absolute numbers on the absorption cross sections. But we're interested in time resolved measurements. So um, over the last couple of generations of PhD students, starting with Lucas Miskikis and then David Wood and finally Dougie Garrett, we've succeeded in doing our first time resolved measurements on this material. And it's quite challenging. You pump the material and you see a change. So this is the sulfur L, L edge uh, uh, unpumped, sulfur L edge pumped, uh, and you pump with a 600 nanometer pulse of about 16 femtosecond duration. But of course, there's lots goes on when you pump a material. And one of the things that goes on is the thin material, very low thermal conductivity, is you heat the thing up. And, and in fact, we, we then went on a long digression of measuring the thermochroicity effects at the oxygen, uh, sorry, at the carbon K edge and the uh, sulfur L edge. And we've learned what that looks like. Um, and we then realized that some of our earlier measurements at the sulfur L edge were, were considerably affected by that heating. So you have to take into account how the, the sample heats up and you have to chop it the right way to, to prevent that. But eventually we were able to make a really clean measurement. And that's what I'm going to show you now at the carbon K edge. At the carbon K edge, um, the, the main feature is this pi star, um, just a, on a pre-edge feature. And that um, is associated with the state that you are filling when you excite the exciton. So you're going to have some sort of signature of something going on there when you create an exciton. And so here is our differential time resolved di di differential absorption measurement at the, uh, of, uh, at the carbon K edge. We see a strong ed edge shift from T0. So when we first pump the material, there's some sort of edge shift associated with the rearrangement of electrons and then the subsequent structural rearrangement in the material. And that's quite interesting. But what's really interesting is this transient uh, additional absorption uh, with, a, uh, with a reduced absorption just to the high energy side of it here and here, which we think is associated with creating the exciton or, or, or creating a large population of excitons, which, which then decays very fast. Uh, and, and the decay me mechanism may be exciton, exciton interaction or something else, um, but we're, we're now uh, trying to interpret this data. But we've got, I, I would argue, unprecedented insight into what goes on in one of these materials when you, when you pump it with, a, with optical photons by probing with time-resolved uh, x-rays. Okay, I'm conscious of the fact that time rolls on. Um, I'm going to now turn to the final topic of the talk, which is uh, about high harmonic generation itself, not, not about the applications of high harmonic sources. And this work came out of stuff we were doing to try and extend this X-ray spectroscopy to the liquid phase. And, 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 and you know, because you can only make soft X-rays with uh, high harmonics, um, you can't easily use the conventional geometries of targets, which tend to have tens of micron thickness. You have to try and develop a target that's got the right geometry and a thickness of only about a micron, otherwise the absorption will kill you. 
Um, in the course of doing that, we realized, well, we might as well have a go at looking at high harmonic generation from this target also. So just a quick uh, uh, re re review. Um, we've been very familiar of, uh, of atomic HHG, the recollision picture, the three-step model. It's been around, well, H atomic HHG has been around for more than 30 years. Uh, the the three-step model has been around for more than 25 years. Uh, and we're all familiar with that. But then about a decade ago, people started seeing really exciting results in condensed phase systems, typically crystalline systems. And there was a lot of excitement of interpreting what those harmonics meant. And, and, and in general, it's now accepted that there are various mechanisms, including intra-band currents, which, which give you non-linearities through the curvature of the band, and also a kind of analog of the recombination mechanism uh, through inter-band transitions, where the electron on the conduction band uh, then re combines um, uh, in, into, the, into the hole left behind. Now this is a, a momentum state uh, for, uh, space picture as opposed to the usual um, uh, configuration space picture that we have in the recollision model, but in, in a sense it's in, in essence the same mechanism. So the question is, what happens in something that's not a crystalline system? Now, there's been some results of amorphous solid systems, but we wanted to look at, at liquid systems because we could and because there's some unanswered questions about liquids and also maybe some technological advantages of using liquids, like the fact you can flow a liquid and therefore have a, a self-healing target and you can do then high harmonic generation at very high rep. So some early work by Ludomaro looking at um, high, lo relatively low order harmonics driven from a mid infrared source and, and, and driven into the optical UV region, um, showing uh, some dependence in the harmonic generation mechanism between water and heavy water, which uh, was discussed um, uh, in terms of, 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 of the dynamics in the material. And then more recently, uh, the group in ETH looking at um, high harmonic generation from a liquid jet similar to ours, and reporting um, cutoffs as high as um, 20 electron volts, um, so really into the VUV now, um, and, and, and attributing this to some kind of pseudo band structure model. Now, I, I have to say, I, I have problems about thinking about a pseudo quasi band structure when we're talking about liquid. There is, there is some nearest neighbor organization, but it's not a high degree of organization as you would get in a genuine lattice. So, so whether you can really talk about a band structure or whether you can really talk about isolated molecules, but in a dense environment is something that I think is challenging and exciting. So we thought we'd do some measurements of our own and try and understand what's going on. So we, we built our apparatus, we developed these, uh, these, these liquid sheet nozzles that allow us to generate micron thick uh, sheet jet so that the thing is like a leaf so that's what it looks like if you look you know, that's what that's what it looks like in, in shape it's a sort of a sheet but in cross section it's only about a micron thick and we pass the laser through it perpendicularly through it and 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 then we look at the harmonics generated using a conventional setup and 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 we can move the sheet jet around we can move it that way and that way and therefore we can probe exactly what the contribution is um, from the liquid and from the surrounding gas vapor and we've able to, to, to really determine that in fact almost all the harmonics that we see come from the liquid and not the vapor. And we do that in various ways. One is to scan the jet vertically and as you go down the jet you quickly get cooling and because of that the vapor pressure surrounding it drops dramatically so you get very very little vapor and you see that registered in the fact that the harmonic spectrum reshapes because you don't get reabsorption in the vapor by the time you get lower down in the jet. So that tells you down there uh, where we're working lower down in the jet there is basically no contribution from the from the vapor you can confirm it then by moving the, the focus across the jet and, and when you're going through the jet there's simply um, th th there's harmonics and as soon as you come off the edge of the jet there's no harmonics even though there's vapor and then finally we we do another experiment where we actually run the uh, the, 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 the laser beam across the surface of the, the liquid uh, and, and again we see nothing because it doesn't penetrate through the through the liquid so okay having established that this the harmonic generation is happening from the liquid. What are its properties? How does it scale? So we did the usual things. We looked at ellipticity scaling, intensity scaling, and CE phase dependence. We're using a few cycle uh, 1.8 micron pulse for this. So we, we, we can do, we can roll the CE phase and, and see whether there's any dependence. The ellipticity scaling is interesting because it shows something that's really similar to the sort of a recombination situation, a gas based target. You've got a relatively narrow ellipticity dependence. It has a, a similar, very similar shape and a very similar 
wick to the gas phase, um, slightly in contrast to what was found at ETH, where they were attributing some irregularities. We did not see any irregularities in electricity dependence. It was really quite smooth and, 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 and behaved as, as you might expect for a dense gas. Um, we also looked at the intensity dependence, and, and that tells you a, a big lesson. As soon as the intensity is above about uh, 40 terawatts per centimeter squared, you get strong saturation effects. You start to, to have plasma effects. You make plasma plumes coming out both sides of the, of the jet, of, 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 the, of the sheet. You really start to disrupt the liquid and cause vaporization, probably getting harmonic generation in the plasma plume, all sorts of complicated effects. So most of our measurements are down here below the onset of that, because then we're working in the liquid and not in some uh, plasma ablation plume, and, and that's, I think, an important uh, factor in, in our work. Um, we find that the um, cutoff harmonics energy scales linearly with intensity, so that's a, a clear trend. We confirmed a number of measurements, and we've also found two things when we look at the C phase dependence of harmonics. First thing I want to emphasize is we see harmonics up to 50 electron volts. So much higher than people have seen before from liquids. And that's, I think, because we're using a longer wavelength and a short pulse. And, 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 and the second thing is we see a very strong C phase dependence near the cutoff. So that's several implications for that. One is it really behaves as you would expect things to behave uh, in a recombination uh, picture for harmonics. So uh, I think this picture that we've got a dense medium with uh, the electron making excursion and returning back, but somehow not always making it back. So there's some damping due to collisions with neighbors. And I'll say a moment, in a moment a bit more about that. The other point is the fact that we got C phase dependence means with this short pulse, if we were just a little bit shorter, we'd probably be making isolated at a second pulses from a liquid. Okay, so our modeling is basically looking at a mechanism of electron scattering that partially frustrates the recombination. And so we've put in real electron scattering uh, cross sections for electrons of the correct uh, uh, kinetic energy and track them through the trajectories of our harmonic calculation and then put them into a full propagation code. And what we see is when we don't include that scattering, we get much higher cutoffs. But when we put the scattering in, we suppress the cutoff, but we still see uh, relatively high harmonics and so we're trying at the moment to understand better how that matches to what we saw in the lab but I think we still feel that the correct way to look at a liquid where there's a small degree of local order is is in terms of a, a frustrated recombination mechanism rather than for instance a band structure and with that I come to my conclusion so both HHG and x-ray fells are now generating isolated at a second pulses um, we've sort of made progress towards identifying the mechanisms of HHG in liquids. I should say that it was liquid isopropanol we focused on, so there might be different things in other liquids. You know, so water, for instance, does have more local structure. And, uh, and uh, there are new measurement capabilities being developed for time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy using these sources. And I told you about the exciton dynamic studies, and I told you about the prospects for nonlinear X-ray spectroscopy. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. I'll clap on behalf of the 61 attendees that you have okay, aside from the panelists. So thanks for a wonderful talk and showing what's possible currently with um, bigger and smaller sources. Um, if anybody has questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box or you can also put them in Slack. Uh, there is one raised hand from, okay, Daria, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, hello, thanks uh, for the talk. So I have uh, a question. So could you maybe please uh, tell a bit more details about your part when you have shown uh, at a second uh, resonant, ex so I guess it was the X-ray absorption spectroscopy from uh, whole dynamics at LCLS? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, if I can go back to sharing my screen, is that allowed? I can just flick back to that slide. Um, <laughs> I didn't spend a long time. Okay, so it was, it was it was this slide, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, essentially, what we did is we were looking at the isopropanol molecule in gas phase, 
um, we, you, we, we had two x-ray pulses. They were generated using a, what's called the fresh slice mode, which allows you to generate two short pulses. In this case, they were as short as three femtoseconds or even shorter than three femtoseconds. So they, they, and they can be tuned to slightly different energies. So we, we chose to have the first pulse tuned to the lower photon energy, about 500 EV. So it couldn't activate any uh, inner shell transitions from the oxygen um, uh, inner shell state. Um, and, but it could ionize any of the valence states. So it would, in principle, have ionized any of those or, or any and all of those valence states which were uh, accessible to it. Then a, what makes the measurement specific is we come in with a second pulse that is tuned um, but for the, to the energy difference between the 1s oxygen state and the valence state of interest. So we basically select only to look at those molecules that have had a hole put into that valence state. And then what we look at as a signal is the Auger decay that happens when that, because um, uh, you by exciting into this inner, inner valence uh, uh, hole, you, you create a new hole in the inner, inner, inner shell, and that then Auger decay. So you look at Auger uh, electrons associated with the oxygen uh, 1s refilling. And, and, and we look as a function of time at the excess electrons. Um, uh, th there's a lot of backgrounds in this because I, I haven't gone into the details because we're actually also uh, opening channels in the carbon in the carbon in the shell, which gives us backgrounds and there's uh, various other backgrounds. But anyway, when you when you sub subtract the backgrounds and handle the, the data analysis correctly, you then see as a function of delay time between the two pulses, uh, a build up of, of around T0, you see a, a rather rapid um, uh, feature that then decays away very fast. And, uh, and that corresponds that the decay time we're finding by, by curve fitting to that is very close to the decay time predicted by Bridget's calculations, which, which are looking at how um, rapidly that whole state decays, taking into account the, 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 the full geometric averaging over the different, uh, uh, way, uh, the different ground states uh, uh, that, that are accessible to, uh, and through zero point uh, spread. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that does. So maybe just to the last, uh, last what you said. So you mean like the whole decay here is uh, like is calculated ge geometry average. So like uh, coupling to nuclear dynamics. Uh, to yeah, coupling. Well, coupling to the geometric spread inherent to the zero point. Um, uh, of the system, uh, but we don't then put in uh, additional nuclear dynamics because in fact, the bigger effect in the very short times is actually um, that, uh, that geometry spread from the zero point. Yeah, you can never, you can never, the message is you can never ignore the nuclear wave function. It, it's always there. But and you have to account for it. So if you, if there's been a number of very interesting papers on this, theoretical papers on this in recent. Very good. Um, there is, um, there Daria, happy with the answer, I hope. Uh, there are two uh, questions from Hans-Jakob Werner. I think uh, you're allowed to ask them yourselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, John, very nice. Hi, talk. Hans, how are you? <laughs> Good. So uh, in our work, we saw a separation of the harmonic generation from gases and liquids because of the wedge angle of the... Yeah, I remember that in your paper. We, we looked for that. And to be honest, we, you can see small effects like that. But to be honest, it's much easier to use the, uh, to use the, the methods we did to, to, to separate. Okay. So um, then I have a related question. And this is about the ellipticity dependence. So mm -hmm. in, in our work, we, we measured the ellipticity dependence of the liquid and gas phase uh, at the same time. And uh, sl somewhat contrary to what you said, actually, so both were perfectly Gaussian, both dependencies. Oh, okay, sorry, I maybe I misrep. Um, I didn't mean to misrepresent what you had seen. I mean, we did not, we, we saw them both Gaussian, okay? So in that case, we're in perfect agreement. Yes, but the, the important point was that the ellipticity dependence in the liquid phase was broad and Oh, yes, I remember that. Right? Because oh, we, we oh, measured oh, them at the same oh, time, oh, we know oh. uh, we can compare them directly. And yeah, the gas um, phase was significantly narrower, and so the way we explained this was in terms of the spatial extension of the elect electron hole, right? I mean, I would make a comment. I mean, I'd, I'd make I'd make the following comment. We we also did see examples where 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 the ellipticity looked broader, but that turned out to be when we were driving harder, and when we were going over into this saturation regime, and then the ellipticity dependence stops being a genuine measure of the fundamentals of the interaction. That's true, but when we measure at the same time gas phase and liquid phase, 
And we did this at many different intensities and different harmonic orders. And the effect is always there. So you always see that the liquid phase dependence is broader than the gas phase. Mm -hmm. And this can be explained. Uh, we did not do a direct, we have not done a direct comparison with gas phase isopropanol because we had no way of getting enough gas phase isopropanol into our sample to do that. As I mentioned, when we try to do gas phase experiments, we can't see it from the vapor from the, from the liquid. So it's, 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 it's partly to do with cooling in the jet. Um, what we did compare with was, uh, you know, other, other atomic systems. And so I don't think we've done as quantitatively a comparison as you did. And the final question, if I may still, uh, Jens, uh, regards the, this high cutoff that you saw up to 50 EV. So yeah. in the meantime, uh, we have done very detailed wavelength dependent studies of the HHG from liquids. And we find that the, there is essentially no wavelength dependence. So we've done what we published initially was 1500 nanometer, but since we've done uh, 800, 400, and 1800, and the cutoff does not extend in our research. Where does your cutoff go to? So the, the cutoff is always uh, around 20, 25 EV at most. We, we see, I, I would just make one comment. We see much lower cutoffs when we drive harder. When we drive below that saturation point, we then see the extended cutoffs. I think cutoff is a very good um, word right now. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, hands no, on. No, I'd be I, happy to talk more offline at some point, but sure, uh, yeah, sure. it was interesting I'm conversation. I'd I, like would, I would encourage you. There is also um, a question from Stefan Hake, which is interesting. I mean, I would really encourage you to use the Slack channel. Uh, to, to follow yeah, up I'll try with and do that. I have another meeting to go to shortly, but I'll do my best to catch up later this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John, again.